Dave, let's dive uh, right in. Let me have you start by unpacking what BLESS is for those who might not be familiar with the model. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, maybe before I do, I, I think part of it for us, and, you know, writing this book and the book really came out of us actually implementing this at our church was I think there's just a lot of confusion and I'd say even increasing confusion about how to love your neighbor and how to share the love of God with other people. Um, I don't know if you saw this, Tony, you, you probably have because you're on top of all this stuff, but we'll share it again. But Barna came back with some research and they said that nearly half of practicing millennial Christians say it's wrong to evangelize. And I specifically, it was 47%, so almost half. But what's kind of wacky about this, okay, is that at the same time, they said that two out of three practicing Christians believe being a witness about Jesus is part of their faith. So it's kind of, hold it. So it's wrong to evangelize, but it is a part of my faith. And I, and I, I think people are, I mean, if it sounds confusing, I think it's because people are genuinely confused about, yeah, how do I love my neighbor and how do I share the, the love of God? And I mean, you got it. I mean, in the Bible, too, I mean, you know, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. I think it's like eight times you got love your neighbor. And I mean, John and I can go back and forth and telling you a lot of different ways that we tried, especially in the early days of our ministry that didn't work. But one of the things that we discovered along the way is it felt like the way that Jesus actually loved his neighbors was by being a blessing. And so well, that's when it was really out of the Gospels and seeing what Jesus was doing. Um, we kind of compiled these different consistent practices he had. And then we tried to put it in a, a way that was memorable. And, and it comes across as blessed. And these are the five practices. B, begin with prayer. L, listen. E, eat. S is serve. And S is story. So begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve, and share your story. And, and we'll... I think elaborate more on those later on. Um, and I'll throw one more thing out there. One, one of the things I think that really put us over the top, you know, because you got it in the Bible, you got it that Jesus was doing it, but we ran across this study called Blessers versus Converters. And this was buried in a doctoral thesis that we found. Um, a, two teams of missionaries went to Thailand, and actually one team went just as what they were kind of known as converters. They were going to win souls, okay? And the others were blessers saying, hey, we're just going to be a blessing wherever God sends us. And they followed these two teams of missionaries for two years. And what they found out is they found out with the converters, they actually had um, only two people became Christ followers over those two years. And it had zero kind of impacts as far as socially or community building, making the place a better place where they lived. But what they discovered with the blessers they researched that is they actually saw 100 converts, 100 people said yes to following Jesus, but it actually created significant kind of social capital along the way as well. And so the, the irony was that the blessers were actually the better converters. Um, so one of the things that we kind of came to the conclusion is like, maybe we need to stick close to Jesus model of how do we actually, you know, bless people. And, um, and that's what we're talking about. Yeah. All right. So, John, uh, Dave kind of started down this path. But as you think about where you were a number of years ago, by the way, how many years ago when you rolled this out to your church? I think initially, probably as many as what, 12 to 15 years ago when we first started, Dave, would you say? Yeah, I think about 12 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what would you add to what David shared about what really prompted you to develop and share this model with your church? Yeah. Uh, good question, Tony. I mean, I, I, I think... Really, what prompted us was uh, kind of our own frustration, you know, that we experienced, and then also the frustrations that we saw in the lives of the folks who would consider a community their church home. Uh, you know, Dave and I were fortunate enough to grow up in a Christ-following home uh, pretty much our entire lives. We we knew, you know, what it means to experience and the hope and purpose that can only be found in a relationship with Christ. And naturally, when you experience that, I mean, you want to share it with people. And uh, I think the sad part is that most of the ways we were taught to share it often kind of felt, I don't know, like forced or, you know, maybe we were trying to get somebody to do something that they didn't seem like they really wanted to do. And I think most Christians probably have had that same experience. And so we felt it personally, but 
Then we also saw it in the lives of the folks who were a part of our church and other churches too. And, and, and through new thing, our, our network of, of churches across the globe, you know, people knew the mission. I mean, our mission at community is, you know, helping people find their way back to God. And I think if you talked to the majority of people at community, they would be able to state that mission. And, and I think that it actually kind of uh, does something inside of them. They're passionate about it. Um, they could repeat it. They could tell you about it. But the truth is, um, many of them still felt the frustration about how to actually live it out. And so, you know, it really was our own frustration, I think, along with what we saw in the lives of the people that we lead that led us on this journey of discovery, which ultimately led us to like what Dave said, it's the life and ministry of Jesus, where we discover these five everyday ways that he loved people and um, and ultimately changed the world. So it really was. It was our own personal frustration with our own attempts at evangelism and reaching people. And then also what we uh, saw in the lives of the folks that we were trying to lead and who were, were really compelled by the mission, but just didn't know what, what does that literally look like practically? How do I do this without, you know, turning people away, which is the last thing anybody wants to do. Right. Yeah. And I think it's the practical nature of it, which we'll get into more in our conversation um, that really distinguishes the, this encouragement around bless. Uh, Dave, for years along those lines, I think many churches have uh, embraced that invest and invite model uh, when it comes to engaging people outside the walls of the church. And I'm curious to hear from you, how is bless similar to invest and invite? But and then how might it be distinctive from that approach? Yeah, I think it's an important question. I, I'm i not against invest, invite, I, but I think when it becomes your only or your primary method of trying to reach people and how to try to, you know, love your neighbor, um, it's going to fall way short. And, and part of it is because, I mean, the invest, invite approach is, is, is very kind of, pastor centric. I mean, most of the ownership for evangelism is on that one person, that person delivering that message and hoping it connects with that person. And, and in some ways you might even say it's presentation specific because you're counting this one moving event. But I think maybe even more important critique of kind of solely, again, I just want to stress that solely leaning on just invest invite is that you're kind of assuming that people are at a certain point as far as being pre-evangelized. Do you remember the, um, gosh, there was a guy out of Wheaton called Head, the, the Ingalls Scale? Do you remember that, Tony? That's right. So in the Ingalls Scale, yeah. really, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm kind of trying to remember it all here. Basically, there were a lot of steps that they said led up to the point where you became a Christ follower. And they actually had, a, had numbers, like you could be one mm -hmm. step away or two steps or five steps or eight steps. And then there were steps on the other side. I think the Invest Invite assumes you are right there just ready to take that step and say yes to Jesus. The thing I love about the blessed practices is number one, where the ownership is really on you just to be a friend. I mean, John and I kind of joke sometimes when we're training people this. It's like when you teach people the blessed practices, it's like a remedial course on how to be a friend. <laughs> It really is. <laughs> but, you know, Dave, I think our culture, we need that um, in, in today's world because it's the craziest thing, especially with social media. We're probably connected to more people than ever before. And yet we probably, if we're honest, have fewer friends than we've ever had. It's the craziest thing. And so I, I think it's it's good to think about bless in those terms because it's almost as if we our culture we need this and and if you and if you think about it i mean what was jesus his earned nickname was friend of sinner and so maybe yeah. you know maybe you got it right so i think i like that part is like hey let's just learn how to be a, a genuinely good friend like jesus was i like that it's also process oriented that kind of takes people where they are and it allows them one step at a time like we were talking about that, that angle scale to get to the place where they're going like you know what I think Jesus was who he said he was. And and the other thing, and maybe we'll get a chance to touch on this too, um, some of the programs that maybe were popular in the past are things you had to add to your life. You know, you got to show up on a Tuesday night. You have to do this thing where with the blessed practices, these are things you're already are probably doing. And it's how do you actually integrate these and be intentional about those in your life. So that's some of the stuff. So I'm not really against you know, kind of the invest and bite. I just think when it becomes the only thing you're counting on, that's a silver bullet there. Right. Mm. 
Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, still want to be prepared on Sunday to make sure we're welcoming people that may be there for the first time and, and giving them an opportunity to hear the good news in our, in our messages on Sunday morning, but complimenting that with, yeah, absolutely. Uh, John, uh, similarly, I think, um, uh, you, I think you would say bless is, is different. In fact, D- Dave actually acknowledged this up front compared to traditional evangelism strategies and programs that we've seen churches engage in the past. Would you agree with that? And how would it differ from some of those traditional evangelism strategies? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, Dave touched on it really well in that this, this really is about how to be a good friend. And I think when you combine what, what you all mentioned, the fact that we're, you know, we're more friendless than we've probably ever been as a culture. And then when you look at the reputation that, that Christians have among non-Christians, uh, I mean, we had a long ways to go. We, we've got to be better friends. I, I, and I think yeah. what, what Dave said, too, is that bless really I don't it's really not even a method or a model as much as it is a way of life. And it, and it truly is how Jesus lived day in and day out. He just went about blessing the people in places he came across every single day. I mean, if you look at, you know, the BM bless, it's it's begin with prayer. Uh, you know, when Jesus started his earthly mission, what did he do? He first went out into a mountainside and he prayed. And I think over and over again, we see Jesus first retreating to pray. You know, you, you could say that uh, prayer preceded and permeated his mission, you know, throughout his time on earth. Uh, if you look at the L and listen, you know, which is listen and bless, you know, no question that asking questions and then listening to people was central to Jesus' life and teachings. Uh, you know, you, you think of the story of, um, of Bartimaeus, the man who was blind, crying out to Jesus for help. And, you know, instead of coming to him immediately and asking or healing him, what did Jesus do? Uh, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, well, why do you think he asked him that question? Well, I think it was because he wanted to offer him the dignity of stating exactly what he wanted and then to have the chance to confess his faith in Christ right then and there. And so over and over again, you see Jesus just living these things out, eating. I mean, good night. So much of Jesus' ministry was centered around eating uh, meals together. He, he performed his first miracle at a wedding feast. Uh, you know, one, one of his most uh, well-known miracles was feeding the 5,000, right? Uh, the night before his crucifixion, he brings his friends together for a meal. Uh, so every one of these, and then you go to serve, you know, Jesus could have been more clear when he said the son of man did not come to be served, but what to serve. And he, and he showed that over and over again. So, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about something that really is an expression of how Christ lived and which is what we as Jesus followers are intended to do anyway. And it's just an attractive way of living that I think has a way of drawing people closer and closer to Jesus as you, as you live this out. Dave, um, just to help for folks that are listening, I think pastors and church leaders are going to be intrigued by this. Um, if you could share how you've seen Bless change people's lives in your church, and then even more broadly, how it has imp- impacted the health and growth of your ministry. I mean, one, one of the things um, that John and I are both you know, big believers in is you reproduce who you are. And... Um, I'll sh- where's my, yeah, my, I got my journal. Anyway, my journal, I don't have it near, near me here, but like even this morning, I'll write the word bless and I write um, like there's um, five different couples that are in my neighborhood that, that I'm praying for every day. And one of the stories I love to tell, because this, this is one of those times where for me, it was you know, kind of, it kind of can, and again, I know this is going to sound bad to your listeners because <laughs> I, I think I started with, Jesus did it, but I needed a doctoral thesis to prove it to me. You might not know this, Tony, but Dave reads doctoral thesis just all the time. He's got a stack of them on his nightstand. He's, he's remarkable <laughs> about that. <laughs> well, the other thing I'm going to confess, too, is, I mean, you know, John just went through and talked about how Jesus did all these blessed practices. But there was a part of me that was kind of like, you know what? Maybe it's a good way to love people, but am I really going to see anybody become a Christian? I'm just keeping it real. And for me, I think what put me over the top was my friend, Michael. Um, I, had a, I had a friend, Michael, who, I mean, I was praying for him every day. And uh, he was a guy that I knew through my son's uh, cross country and track team. And so I started doing the bless practice. So I'm praying for him every day. And you have to know a little bit about Michael. He's he's a kind of a hard nosed skeptic. And I remember the first time we even started talking about anything to do with church and, and he 
I won't use the language he used, but basically he's like, you know, I don't want anything to do, have anything to do with that BS. And, um, but he kind of liked me and I liked him. And so I'm praying for him. And every time we go to a cross country track meet, we'd always hang out there cheering for our boys and we would talk. He would talk and, you know, and I would listen to him. And um, at some point, actually, he initiated, he initiated with me. He said, hey, you know what? I got some questions I'd love to bounce off you. He said, what if, what if we got together for breakfast sometime? And I was like, yeah. And so we started eating breakfast together. And then sometimes he also, he had a knack for finding new restaurants. And he always liked to introduce these new restaurants to me. So then we'd, we'd go out to these new restaurants, you know, do that kind of thing. And so now I'm praying for him. I'm listening to him. We're, eat, we're doing meals together. And again, kind of like we joked before, I'm, I'm just, we're becoming like friends. And um, I remember we were at um, a breakfast place, uh, Experience Cafe, in the corner booth. And uh, he's told me, he said, you know what, Dave, it was uh, 20 years ago today. And I was like, what? And he started, he'd already hit it at some of the stuff, but he began to unpack that it was 20 years ago. And that was actually anniversary day where he'd been in a car accident with his best friend, Jay. And his best friend, Jay, died in that car and Michael survived. And actually, mm -hmm. Michael was found negligent. And he said, um, I have to tell you, for, for 20 years, I felt the burden of trying to live two lives, one for me and one for my friend, Jay. And basically, he was, he was, at, he was going like, where do I find forgiveness for that? And... It, that, and I got to, and he knew I was a Christian by that point, of course. And, and, um, and I got to share, yeah, here's how I've found forgiveness and not only forgiveness, but then also like redemption. Like he can take the, the crappiest stuff in your life and actually end up using it for great good. And I got to see him say yes to Jesus. So I'm sharing the story then. Right. And, um, I got it. And I got a chance to baptize him. And whenever I get a chance to tell that story to me, you know, as pastors, if you're in a pretty dynamic church, you'll see people come to faith and you see you get a chance to baptize people, but they're not always your friend. You know what I'm saying? But in that case, that was like it was like my friend. And it was just it was just really cool to be able to, you know, get to, you know, I think be a good friend to him. And because uh, I think a lot of people and here, here, maybe I'll broaden it now, because I think I think our people in our churches are going like, OK, how? Give me the how. How do I love my neighbor? Because I don't, I think most people that are coming to our churches, they want to. They just don't know how. And, and that's one of the things I've appreciated for me personally. And I've seen in the life of our church. It, it gives us real clear handles on here's how you can do this in a way that fits who you are. Um, so that's kind of how it's impacted me and, and our church. Yeah. So, uh, John, on that note, let's get practical here. And maybe if you can kind of go back in time a little bit, when you first began to introduce Bless to Community Christian Church, how did you encourage folks in your, in your ministry, your, in your church to begin to engage this and to begin to bless others practically? What did that look like? Yeah. Good, good question, Tony. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we, we really do encourage people to wake up every day and begin with prayer. You know, just start right there and ask God, maybe even before your heat, feet hit the floor when you're getting out of bed, God, who do you want me to bless today? And I love how Dave, you know, talked about that journal that he's keeping where he's got that list of people. You know, I've got it on my smartphone too. Same thing. I'm praying for certain people, but then I'm also saying, God, you know what? There might be um, serendipitous opportunities throughout the course of the day too that I'm not even aware of yet where you're going to give me a chance to bless somebody. And so it's really twofold. It's like what you're planning to with a certain list of people, but then there's also those opportunities that the Holy Spirit, you know, gives me throughout the course of the day when I'm really on top of things. Those, those sometimes are even the most fun. And so I, I think it starts there with just encourage people to make this a part of their, their life. Um, you know, we also encourage people, um, and if you look actually in our book, uh, bless and at the end of chapter three, there's a graphic uh, that asks you to fill out a, who is my uh, neighbor map? And then there you can list as many as eight people that you'd like to bless. And, and it can be people that, you know, live nearby. It can be people you work out with. It could be people uh, that you work with. But I think the point is to get super intentional. And uh, like Dave said, that along with like the journal and then in small groups, we're encouraging people when they show up. We ask our leaders 
to make that intentional part of the conversation. So you're asking the people in your group, okay, who did you bless this week? And guess what? If you say, well, you know, I began with prayer and I'm praying for Joe, Susan, and Sam, that counts. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, and that's one of the things I love about the bless. I think it elevates prayer and says, no, prayer is not the least we can do or the last thing we should do. It's the first and most important thing we can do. And that's an actual missional practice. That's a way that you're friend, befriending people and hopefully helping them find their way back to God. So in small groups, in addition to that, you know, we do message series, you know, every year, multiple message series on bless. It's also sprinkled out throughout other messages uh, on the weekends. And then we have classes where we're training and equipping people that want to take a deeper dive. I, I will say this, though, and I think one of the mistakes a lot of churches can make is uh, they'll want to dive into a message series first as a way to implement bless. And I think David agrees with me. We always say, no, no, back off. You first, you know, you first mm -hmm. take it. You make your list, read the book, you know, and start living it out yourself. So you've got, I mean, what Dave shared, that's that's priceless, right? For him to be able to get up and actually say, no, I'm not just asking you to do this. This is a part of my daily life already. Then circle up with your leadership team and you start living that out as well. Do that before you train your staff and before you do the message series so you can genuinely create like a, a culture of bless uh, throughout your entire your entire church. Uh, Dave, uh, as we've talked about earlier, I mean, this is something that Community Christian Church has been engaging for now more than a decade how do you keep this fresh, especially for folks who have been around your church for many years? Yeah, well, I mean, Tony, first of all, to be to be intentionally redundant. I mean, I've said it. John said it. but I'm going to say it again. Um, as a church leader, you have to do it. And I go, that may not. You may be like, OK, how does that keep it fresh? Well, it keeps it fresh because you are a culture creator. And when you do it, you're, you're going to. The, the behaviors that, that you have bought into and the practice that you bought into are going to get are going to get reproduced in the life of your church. So if you want to keep it fresh, you keep doing it and then you'll keep talking about it and you'll keep having stories. Um, in addition to that, um, one of the things I mean, John touched on this, too, but we do. We have a series we'll do on it almost every year. We drip it into different teachings throughout the year. We have training that we do. We, we also on Sundays, we do something, um, a video every week called Be the Church. And it's usually kind of an update on some exciting thing that's happening in the life of Community Christian Church. And about once a month, we try to introduce also a blessed story. So they get to hear a story oh, from someone on that. That's awesome. But I think one of the things that John and I are probably most excited about that's going to be new is we're, uh, we're partnering with the Bless Every Home app. And I don't know if you've seen that or not, but um, it's a... I've heard about that. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, it is a great tool. And it's been around for a little while, but we're just really kind of starting... It's surprising it's happened before now, a partnership with them. And they're, we're going to completely redo it. But if you log into this app, and I would, for people listening, it'll be at least the next version will be available sometime in March. Um, it actually has, it's, it's got a, a really robust database behind it. So it actually will tell you the names of your neighbors. And so then out of that, you can make a daily prayer list and you can pray for them. And then it'll actually, in time, what we're working through is so you'll actually it's had some kind of almost like gamification to it so that you're going, hey, yeah, I prayed for that person. I listened to that person. I ate with that person. I served that person. I shared my story. And so you can really keep track of. And for church leaders, the thing that's going to be really cool is you'll actually be able to, you know, like say, Tony, you got a church of 100 folks. You better look and go like, hey, look, 75 of my folks are using the Bless app. And 50 of them prayed for people this week. And 25 of them listened and 10 of them had meals with people. And you could bring that every Sunday and really celebrate, hey, and catch them doing it right. Here's what we're doing. And I think um, I think that's one of the ways it's going to keep it really fresh. And John and I are both very pumped about that. Yeah, that's exciting. I could just chime John, in and quick. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, Tony, one of the things that's cool about that, too, is I feel like so often the only way we've been able to measure our evangelistic efforts is when someone commits their life to Christ and a lot of churches, it's through adult baptism. And let's face it. I mean, like, uh, you know, scripture talks about what Paul plants the seed of Paulus water. We don't, we don't know how our efforts are going to reap fruit down the road. Now we get to actually, I think in a, in a really cool sort of helpful way and encouraging way, give people the opportunity to kind of measure the fact that, yeah, they're actually making efforts evangelistically in a number of different ways that will eventually contribute to somebody, uh, 
you know, placing their trust in Jesus and committing their lives to Christ. And they can measure that. And uh, I, I'm just hoping that that's going to be an encouragement to a lot of folks out there, too. That's good. Uh, so, John, uh, just uh, tell me with Bless, is that your only strategy at Community Christian Church for reaching new people? And if not, what are some other strategies that you're engaging to reach new people who are currently outside the church and maybe even outside the faith? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Bless, again, is the primary way we're training and equipping individuals to to live out um, their faith. But, um, you know, everything hopefully we do at Community revolves around this idea of helping people find their way back to God. And, um, you know, like many churches, we're seeing more and more people online, you know, communityonline.tv. Uh, we're seeing, you know, thousands of people engage with us digitally through that platform. Uh, we're seeing God do some really incredible work, Tony, right now through our micro churches. Uh, Dave probably has the latest number, but I think we have close to 3,000 people locally and globally that are now engaging with us through these smaller churches uh, that are led by people who want to reach people who we normally wouldn't be able to reach. Um, you know, we also know that, you know, God reaches people as the church goes about the work of restorative justice. And so our community cares ministry and our church multiplication work through new thing in the city and in other places, locally and globally is also reaching people who don't know Jesus. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of different ways. You know what, uh, we, we gotta, we, you gotta, we gotta give a plug for Alpha though. Alpha has been a huge um, help yeah. to us as well. And and if it's interesting, if I know how how much have you ever have you ever done Alpha, Tony? I have not personally, but a lot of the churches that we're working with are engaging with Alpha. Yes, I I mean again, I got nothing, I got no stake in this game, but I think the two best evangelistic tools in a in a in a post Christian. Um, era that we're living in right now is is i would say the blessed practice and alpha and if you look at alpha too i mean it's it it is it's very much it's kind of like a concentrated version of the blessed practice because i mean there is you're praying for people before you invite them you show up and, the, and they, they create a community where there's no wrong there's any question could be answered any i'm sorry any question could be asked you're, you're there really just to listen to people's questions their doubts the ones that do it right they also have a meal so they're eating together. So they're developing real community. You get a chance then to serve them by responding to their questions. And, and they always share the gospel story. I mean, it's, I, I, I think those two things, if you do want to centralize a program around it, I think Alpha is great and it works hand in glove with your people using the blessed practices. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm actually in an Alpha, <laughs> Alpha group right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of Alpha. It's, it's yeah. such, such good stuff. Well, I think it's just, it's just good for pastors to hear too that there are many strategies that we can be using to share the good news beyond the walls of the church. And it's good to be thinking about uh, maybe multiple ways to connect with people um, rather than just a, a strategy. Um, but it's also good reminder. We have to have this framework, this focus around how we're encouraging people though to engage with people outside the walls of the church as well. And that's where blessed can come in. Uh, we alluded to this a little bit earlier, Dave, but I also know you have some great Sunday services at Community Christian Church. So what what role do you think the church's weekend services should have in reaching new people? We, we touched on a little bit. I do think, I mean, what you're really wanting to create is the evangelistic culture where everybody that becomes the norm. And I think you can do that through your weekend services. Um, and I think through, you know, through the teaching of those biblical values, through telling those kind of stories, through actually also sharing how you are living out those behaviors yourself creates that kind of, that kind of culture. Um, you can do equipping through your teaching. Um, one of the things that we also do, we just had two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had a commissioning service. And this is an annual deal for us where we ask people, hey, if you're willing to make a commitment, and you're going to be on mission and use these blessed practices, you know, where you live, work and play. We want you to come forward. We want you to know we are for you. We want to pray for you. So we anoint them. It's like almost like your ordination. And, and we send them out. And I would I throw this in, too. I mean. Because we were talking about the, you know, the uh, the, in, the in, invest and invite. I think there are times where you go like, no, we need to ask people, okay, are you ready to make a commitment to Jesus? And I think, you, and sometimes um, that best happens in a, in, a, in a weekend service. And I think 
go for it. Yeah. And that's, I think, the point I wanted to get to. This is not an either or conversation. This really is a both and conversation. All right, John, let me wrap up here. I know there are going to be pastors that are interested in using BLESS with their congregations. Uh, So what are some specific steps you would encourage them to take as they begin to explore how to really roll this out so that folks are blessing their neighbors, blessing folks in their lives? Yeah, uh, sure, Tony. Yeah, I mean, you know, shameless plug, I, I would encourage people to buy the book, Bless, Five Everyday Ways to Love Your Neighbor and Change the World. I think, I think it is a good place to start. And I would go to that uh, chapter three and fill out that map, make your own list of the people you believe God wants you to bless. And then uh, get your leadership team, you know, to do it along with you. Start asking each other, who did you bless this week? Uh, you know, I, uh, I think that's, that's a, it's a great way to start. Uh, for more information on that, folks can go to bless-book.org. Uh, we also have a, a Bless Family resource, which is you know great for helping families, uh, children, and parents together become blessers in their neighborhood. Uh, we've got a great series of videos that can be used in small groups, and um, you know finally, Dave mentioned the app. I think the app's another great tool that you can find more about it. Theblesschallenge dot com. But really, I mean, if anybody wants to know any more about any of this, uh, they're they're more than welcome to email Dave or myself. Uh, John Ferguson, J-O-N, Ferguson at communitychristian.org, uh, Dave Ferguson at communitychristian.org, and we'll put you in touch with the right people to get whatever help you need uh, to start blessing people as soon as you can.